Well, what a day. I can't even believe it. We had a huge bounce, 4.6% on the S&P. Uh, the volatility index, the VIX, has dropped down to 33 points from that high of like, I think it was up as high as 49 at one point. But uh, yeah, so it is crushed back down. I think this is the time to today or Tuesday when you guys are watching this video, that'll be the day when I start actually putting in some plays. Um, I've been pushing off rolling my uh, March positions. I've got a couple of positions on that I'm gonna roll out to the April expiration. And just like we did in the video yesterday that you guys have had a ton of questions on. And thank you very much for that, by the way. This was uh, an amazing response. I only had about 500 views yesterday on that video, but there was a huge amount of really great questions. So I've decided today to do my very first question and answer video, where I'm just gonna read through some of the great questions. And if I missed yours, um, I'm sorry about that. Uh, there are a lot, there's a lot going on in my life in general um, online as my account gets bigger and bigger. Uh, as you guys know, I have my Patreon account, so my patrons get priority messages. I do try to get through them all, but they are getting more and more every day. So please uh, feel free to leave a comment down in, below in any of my videos, and I will look at them. If you don't hear from me right away, just ask again on another video or one of my newer videos, because uh, I do try to answer the questions. Today, I'm just gonna jump right into this. Let's go through some of these great questions. So I've made a list and the first questions are about Patreon. Is there some minimum required knowledge in trading one should have be before doing that? And if so, do you have videos on teaching those basics? Well, all of my videos that I make are available for free on YouTube. So you definitely uh, should not be signing up for Patreon expecting that uh, there's gonna be special videos specifically for patrons. That's just not how that works. Um, I, When I started this channel, I wanted my content to be free for everyone. And I was, I was a little reluctant in, in providing my actual trades to people. And that was why I decided to start the Patreon. So the, the idea with Patreon is that we follow my specific trades, uh, but when I'm doing, and then all my research as well, like when we're looking at dividend stocks, um, I do in-depth technical analysis on stocks that I'm looking to purchase. Um, in the last couple of months, there hasn't been a lot of stock buying because the market's been so high, it's been a bit crazy, but there's gonna be definitely some more as this sell-off continues over the next month. Yeah, so on Patreon, the actual trade, so actually purchasing dividend stocks or actually um, making options trades, that's kind of the primary focus of Patreon. The video instructions are on YouTube. If you have a specific topic that I haven't covered, please just leave a comment below, and uh, if it's a good topic, then I will get to it. Next question, do you do paid consultations for specific recommendations? I do not, I'm not a professional investor, I don't work in the finance industry and um, I don't have accreditation to do that so I, I can't really charge people for something that I, am, I don't do, it's not my profession. Would someone living in the USA be able to follow all of your trades? Well, of course, my, my primary investment strategy is North American stocks, uh, so I invest in both the Canadian side and the American exchanges uh, for both dividend plays, growth stocks, and then all of, almost all of my option plays are on the American exchanges. I do occasionally do a Canadian option trade, but to be honest, we just don't have enough liquidity on the Canadian side, so it's much easier to place the trades on the American side. How much minimum would someone have to have in their account to follow trades with you? My personal thought is that people that are starting out, when you have a, a small valued account, index funds are the way to go. You, you're cutting out your fees, you're cutting out management fees, um, you're getting instant diversification. Uh, so following specific trades, not really a great idea until your account is in that kind of like 10,000 plus. Uh, range and then probably even higher than that. I mean, I'm I'm putting on trades that are, you know, it's it's not uncommon for me to put on trades that are five or ten thousand dollars at a time on a single stock. So, I would expect that most people have a fairly reasonably sized account. Um, if your account is under ten thousand. I would just be investing in index funds. That's the easy way. Just buy some SPY. It's on sale right now. It dropped twenty percent last week, so uh, it's a good time to buy. 
Okay, with regards to selling puts, now this is a strategy that I love because I am a long-term dividend investor. So when I look for, especially growth stocks, when I'm looking at getting an entry point, last um, the last video I did was on Etsy and we were talking about it being at $58.76 and what I wanted to do was buy it for less than that. So that's when I would employ a selling a put instead of buying stock. So I'm using it as a replacement and that's how I'm gonna answer these questions specifically when I'm comparing selling the put option comparatively to buying 100 shares of stock. So the first question is how much money were you ask, actually risking? Well, in answer to that question, if I sold one contract and it was $50, then I would be on the line essentially for purchasing 100 shares at $50, which is 5,000 American dollars. That, of course, I receive a bit of credit for that. So in the, the last video scenario, I was receiving a credit of $110 for that contract, minus my fees. So the actual risk was $5,000 for the, for the shares that I would be purchasing, minus the $110 in fees. So it would be $4,890. And uh, that would be the total risk. Now, of course, I don't really look at it that way because I'm investing in the company and I don't think that Etsy stock is gonna go to zero. So my risk that I'm taking, it, theoretically, that's what I'm risking, but in my mind, I'm not really risking that much. I hope that makes a little bit of sense. This is way better than being an outright buyer of stock. It's like value investing. At one point, you mentioned that you conduct over 20 trades a month. How big of a portfolio account value should that be in order to make that number of trades? Well, if we use that past example, if we're putting on a $5,000 trade for one contract of Etsy, and we want to have a, you know, a position in our account that is generally not over 2 to 3% of our total account value, then we would need an account of approximately $200,000 to put on those put trades like that. 20 trades would be half that value. So that would probably be the max that I would put on if I had a $200,000 account, uh, 20 trades that were each $5,000 each or $100,000 of the total value. Um, I actually prefer to trade with way less money. Um, because I've been traveling, my, my uh, option positions were actually less than 2% of my total net worth. Uh, they're very, very low. Um, I might trade up to 25% of my total net worth when I'm trading options. Now, you also have to remember that you can trade options and put protection on them. So you could sell the, the put and you could buy a lower put, very much reduce your risk and therefore the amount of margin required. We could easily be putting on these trades that have a max loss of $500 rather than a max loss of $5,000. Then you could generate way more trades. So that would be like using an iron condor uh, in replacement of a strangle or using a put spread rather than just a naked put. As the stock price moves below and above the strike price, couldn't a buyer put those options to you, exercise their option at any time, and not have to wait until expiry? That is, of course, if you do not make the adjustments you made prior to the stock hitting the strike price. So technically, in North American markets, an option can be assigned at any time. It doesn't matter if it's out of the money or in, no, in the money. Now, the question is whether or not it would make sense to do so. It doesn't make sense for the out of the money uh, put contract, a short one, to be assigned because the value is less than the person can actually make by just buying the shares on the open market and then selling them themselves. So it makes no sense for out of the money. And that actually happens right up to the out of the money position and then slightly into the in the money position because we're talking about intrinsic and extrinsic value at that point. So once the stock goes down below the sold put contract price, then it becomes in the money and the risk increases. It definitely increases the closer we get to expiration as well. So it depends on whether or not the stock is way below the put price or really, really close to the expiration date. Those are things that increase the risk of being assigned. I have been assigned on shares that were way out. I've been assigned on shares that were like six weeks out and I just shook my head and thought, well, what, like how that, how did that happen? And honestly, it's just part of trading. It doesn't bother me all that much. I just sell off the shares and then I can just, 
the sell the put again for the for the next month out or for a longer term and recoup that money it it really just works out as a wash um, on the put side would you be better off selling a put longer out say three to four months um, honestly, I don't. Uh, when I started option trading, I was actually trading on a four week window. So I was selling a put uh, basically with a month left and then letting it expire. And I have found that I've had better results with keeping contracts for a shorter time. And so I kind of extend at first I extended it out to six weeks. So I was selling the put at around the six week mark and then letting it expire. And now that I've and now that I've been doing this a while, I realized that uh, there's a lot of tail risk in the end and because our, our gamma rates increase at the end of a trade. That's pretty technical, but basically as we get closer, there's less theta decay and we end up increasing our risk because the stock can move a little and that adjusts the price of the option quite a lot. So to reduce that risk and kind of keep a smoother yield, what I did was I'm still trading on that three to four week window. I've just kind of moved it out. So I'm, I'm opening my trade somewhere between 60 and 30 days before option expiration. And then I'm closing it somewhere between uh, 25 and 15 days. So in this case, with the, the market being crazy high volatility last week, I didn't make any adjustments because I was expecting that the, the VIX would drop which it has, and that means I'll be able to roll these contracts for a little bit more manageable price, or I'll close them for a small loss, depending on where they are. So in this particular cycle, I waited a little bit longer. Sometimes I close right at 21 days. Sometimes I start closing them as early as 28 days. I also close all of my options that have made 50% of max profit in less than 50% of the time early. Like that, that's kind of immediately, if I can make half of the money that I was going to make in less than half the time, the math just makes sense. I just close that and then I redeploy that money into a new trade. What premium amount is generally worth your time? Well, that's a tough one. Once you get proficient at putting in these trades, it actually is really simple. I mean, I can put in three or four trades. My time sucker is actually making my post to Patreon. It's like, I, it takes me way longer to write about what I've done than actually enter the trades. Um, because once you're, it's the same as buying stock. So we just have to put in the bid price and the stock that we're looking at and push enter. I mean, it generally doesn't take more than a few minutes. I can knock off three or four trades in under 10 minutes pretty easily, um, you know, going through all of the data. So the, time for me is less because I'm really efficient at it. Uh, so the premium amount, I mean, obviously a premium has to cover your fees. So if you're paying $10 fees, it like barely makes sense to put on a position that's making only $30 because a third of your profit is going to fees. And then if you have to close early, you know, another third of your profit goes to, to fees. So if you have, if it costs you $10 to put on a trade, I mean, I would not be collecting premium less than $100 or, or one, $1 per contract. Uh, that would be like the minimum I would look at. Um, if I'm using iron condors and I have um, a defined risk, I usually want to put on one third the width of that risk. So say I've got a $500 or a $5 wide option um, spread, I want to collect at least $1.66 in order to cover the, the cost. So I'm basically risking two to make one. And I found that every time that I don't take enough credit at the beginning, I end up either scratching on the trade or rolling out, not making enough profit. So I want to make sure that I'm waiting and entering good trades. That's, that's key. So that's that one third rule that I like to use. All right, let's talk about rolling puts for a second. This is specific to yesterday's video where we were talking about uh, rolling out and continually doing it to try to, to recoup uh, some losses rather than taking a loss. When will you decide to roll the stock? Is it when the price drops below a certain percentage, below a strong support level, and or very close to expiration date? Well, I don't really use percentages and I definitely don't use support levels. Um, I, time is really the thing for me. I roll the stock based on what's going on with the expectation of the stock. I mean, I don't always roll. Sometimes I have to close for a loss. so. 
If I think that the stock is gonna go back up in value, then absolutely I'll roll. And again, I said it before, but if I've entered the trade somewhere between 60 and 30 days before expiration, then I'm looking to roll that stock somewhere between 25 and uh, 15 days, with 21 days being kind of the optimal place for me to roll out. That, of course, is if the IV is high enough and I can collect enough pre premium. I never want to roll for a debit. I mean, if the trade is losing value, I would just cut my losses and get out of it and put on a new trade. I would never chase a trade down. So if I can collect enough premium to cover my fees, then I will roll it out if my expectation is the stock that's going to recover. Do you look at IV when you roll the stock? Does it matter? Yes, I, I think I just answered that question. But yes, definitely uh, the IV is part of it. If we're, we're making a decision, we can either close that trade or we can roll it. That's it. So we have to make that decision based on IV rank. It really comes down to how much premium we're able to collect. When the IV rank is higher, we're collecting more premium. Therefore, we have more likelihood that the, pre the volatility is going to drop and that we will be able to buy it back for cheaper. That's the whole goal. Do you always roll using the same strike price or make adjustments and pick a strike price that is closer to at the money, out of the money? With regards to puts, I almost always roll at the same price. Uh, I just keep rolling that strike. Now, I haven't always done that. Uh, I used to kind of roll down my puts sometimes and then it just is cutting out the premium that you're collecting and making it longer in order to gain back or recoup any potential loss. So I have found that rolling down doesn't work. I just keep the price as is unless there's not lo enough liquidity. If say your stock goes way down and you haven't closed it, I mean, I try to close them now. So if I get to like that two X mark, I close, which means if I originally collected a hundred dollars in premium, then when the, the, if the value of the option shoots up and gets to $300 and it's continuing to go up, I just close out the trade rate then and there. So I originally collected a hundred bucks and then I paid out 300 so to close it, and then I've had a $200 loss. That's kind of that reward to risk ratio that I talked about before, where I'm risking two to make one. So that would be more ideal to close the trade before it gets really out of hand. But sometimes it happens. I had like Apple shares that I rolled for two years and the price was so depressed. It just like was, it got so slammed. It was 60 bucks in the money. And at that, in that point in time, I actually did uh, roll down the puts as I was rolling out in time. And then as the stock started to recover, I rolled those puts back up. And that strategy did end up being worthwhile in the end. Uh, maximum, how many times will you roll the same stock? Uh, I have no maximum. I mean, I, the longest I've ever done it is over two years I've rolled a position. Uh, really, it depended on how, many, how much the IV was. If there was enough premium to be collected and I still wasn't prepared to just buy that stock outright, I just kept rolling. That was on an Apple trade and you know, I'm fairly bullish on Apple and have been for the last couple of years and it served me quite well selling the options on, on that particular stock. Will you do the same for an iron condor when the price drops under the sell put long put or raise above sell the call long call? This question was pertaining to adjusting the, the strike prices. And with iron condors specifically, they're really tough to adjust. I mean, you, you basically have put on that trade right at the get go. So you're kind of locked into it. If at 21 days, if it's not profitable and it's not gonna get closed, then I'll just hold it longer and I'll hold it right up to expiration if I need to uh, because I'm, I've got a max loss built into it. So I'm certainly not gonna close it early for the maximum loss and because the stock could bounce back. I mean, we just saw a four, a four and a half percent rise today in the markets. I have an iron condor right now on the spies and the spies had actually dropped way down out of range and then today it bounced right back up into range. So there would be no sense in me closing it last week when there was 21 days to expiration where I can just wait a little bit more time and now I can close that trade for a much smaller loss if I want to, or I can roll it out in time now, which is more likely what I'll do. And I won't adjust the strikes at all. I'll keep as wide a target range as possible, unless of course there's no premium to be collected on one side. When I look at it tonight, I'll, I'll be able to tell, like if I'm just getting a couple pennies, then that makes no sense. I might not, I might not roll the call position at all. I might just keep it as a, 
as a put position with maximum loss and, and take off the call side, which is called legging out. Uh, something I don't generally like to do, but we're in an extreme market situation right now. So it really depends on market situation as to what to do. But generally speaking, iron condors, I don't adjust. I just put on the trade and then I close them with 21 days to expiration. And then I do the next monthly cycle. And I'm actually really happy with all of my iron condors that I had on because I'm traveling right now and because the market's in a bad time zone for me. My portfolio was just, you know, luckily barely got touched last week because I had almost all protected positions on. So I can only, I, I didn't have to manage any naked positions at all, which was great. Uh, not something I recommend. I mean, I, there's more premium to be collected in naked positions, so you can, if you can do it and you can watch it, then there, that's where you make your money. But since I was traveling, I was taking reduced risk in case something happened, and I'm fortunately this is this has happened at a time where I was in that position, which is really nice. Anyways, I think I've about exhausted this list of questions for today. Thank you guys so much again for that. Uh, remember to check out my Patreon page because that's a great community where we have now over 70 subscribers and everybody can talk back and forth and we can actually generate quite a lot of information from other traders that are like-minded watching these videos together. And that's the whole idea is community building so we can all get rich together. Thanks so much for watching. See you very soon.